students, welcome faculty, welcome uh, any administrators, okay, to the first African American meeting at Passaic County Community College. Uh, today we celebrate African American History Month to honor those who have impacted the world we live in. We honor those who've witnessed, participated, and led the movement for social change in this wonderful country. Please feel free to be present, to listen, and to enjoy a glimpse of the rich heritage of this nation. Feel free to share and to take time and to reflect on words and thoughts of inspiration that you're going to hear today. Feel free to expand your minds and embark on us with a journey of learning today. Okay. Um, before we begin, I'm going to go ahead and play a video by Eric Thomas. Does anyone know who Eric Thomas is? Good, you're gonna learn who he is today. He is an inspirational speaker in community colleges throughout the South in this country. He's a pretty powerful speaker with youth especially in community colleges. I got just a couple lessons for you today, man. A couple lessons, and they come from my man Cam News. Now listen to me. Y'all know, y'all know I believe green, white, baby. Green, white. But on my way home, uh, uh, after Thanksgiving, that Friday, I'm coming home from Chicago, all right? And I'm, and I'm listening to satellite radio, and I'm listening to Auburn against, you know what I'm saying, Alabama. And I'm, I'm for real, like, I'm into this game. Why? Because, for real, man, they, they just been beating my man Cam Newton down. You know, the week prior to that, the week before that, bro, they just like, you know, my man this, he that, his father, all these allegations, they try to strip my man from his, his eligibility to play in the game. So I'm just kind of following my man because they're undefeated, and I just want to see at, from one leader to the next, right? From one leader to the next, I just want to see how my man going to handle it. Because I told you before, life going to knock you down. And I want to see, can my man Cam handle this, this pressure? How is he going to take this pressure? Man, I'm watching my man against Georgia. Hey, my man come out, put up 49 points as if what? As if, man, he not even on the news. Like, he not on every talk show. Like, he not in the newspaper. My man come out and he do what he got to do and act like ain't nothing happened. That's my first principle in case you missed it. In case you missed what I just said, what I learned, three things I got from my man Cam Newton, right? Watching my man every week, close to close, face to face. I'm watching my man. I'm studying my man. I'm watching all his moves. I want to see how he can get through this trial, this tribulation. First thing I found out about this kid, man, was you got a first principle. You got to show up. Like, for real. Principle number one, you can't win the game if you ain't in the game. And, man, my man not only showed up to the game, he showed up. He did what he had to do. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He showed up. That's principle number one. You got to show up. Listen to what I'm saying. E.T. told you, before when I was younger, what did I do? I took flight. I took flight every time it got hard. Every time it got difficult, I left. The phone would ring. I got a spirit of anxiety. Then I learned from my man, man. It's happened in my own personal life, man. At some point in life, you just got to stand up to the giants. At some point, you just got to show up. At some point, listen to me, you will never be successful if you don't show up. It was Woody Allen who said it like this. He said that 75%, that's right, 75% of life's success just means showing up. That's 75% of success you just show up. You just say, I'm accounted for, I'm present, I'm here, and I ain't going nowhere. No matter how hard it is, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how challenging it is. And I saw Cam Newton put that helmet on. I saw him strap up, come out against Georgia, and he did his thing like nothing had ever happened. Show up. Then I'm watching, I'm like, wow, man, I'm watching, I'm, I'm, I'm listening on satellite radio, and I'm like, wow, my man's undefeated. He going up against Alabama. He, he close to the Heisman Trophy. I mean, this thing is going to place him in a place in the NFL that's going to put him, you know, I'm talking about high in the draft. And this game, right, this one game, this one game is going, is going to determine maybe his, his future in the NFL. And I'm listening, 7-0. They playing in Alabama. We talking about the national champions last year. In Alabama, Crimson Tide, you could just see the Crimson all through the stadium, 14 nothing, 21 nothing, And you can hear the commentator say, oh, it's like Alabama, they got this one in their head. I don't know how Auburn's going to come back from this. They went into the half 24-7. Number two, man, my number two principal, you better get it, man, you better get it. They came back out, right? 
they came back out, right? I don't know what the coach, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall. I don't know what the coach of Auburn said to these boys. But when they came back out, when they came out, they made it happen. So listen to me. Number two, number two, when you better catch this, you got to believe in the dark. You got to believe when you can't see it. You got to believe in the dark, what the creator told you in the light. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And when things are bleak, when things are dark, when things seem like, hey, we're not going to make it happen. We're not going to be able to win. you got to believe in the dark what the Creator told you in the light. That's number one, man. Faith, man. Y'all hear me talk about it all the time. You hear me talk about faith as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You can't see it. You can't touch it. You don't know that it's real, so they're real in your mind. But in your mind, you feel it. With your imagination, you know it can happen. Impossible is nothing. They came back out, man. They came back out in that second half. And I promise you, you know how the story ends. Yeah, they won 28, I think, 27. And Alabama only scored once, and that was off like some crazy um, mishap, you know, uh, uh, something that happened with Auburn. But let me tell you this. They came back. The defense shut Alabama down. My man Cam Newton came out like they was winning the game, like they had been in the game the whole time and did what he had to do to win it all. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Number one, show up. Stop running, man. Stop running. Stop quitting. Stop giving up. Stop giving in. Not only face the giant, man, go meet the doggone giant. You go get to the giant before the giant get to you. Number two, man, you got to believe. When you can't see it, you got to believe it. You got to call it when all the odds are against you. You hear what I'm saying, man? You got to believe. The last one, the last principle, bring it in, bring it in, bring it in. My last principle is this, man. Sometimes in life, you're going to have to just play through it. That's right. Cam Newton, no first downs. I mean, three and outs. Sometimes in life, man, if you're going to win, you're going to have to just learn to play through it. Play through the what? Play through the disappointments because it's going to be some. Let me tell you something about life, bro. Seriously. That if you're going to be successful in life, it's going to be a whole lot of failures between starting and success. It's going to be a whole lot of failure in between. And what you got to do is learn to play through. Listen to me. The haters play through it. Don't listen to it. You can't spend your time worrying about the failures. You can't spend your time worrying about the mistakes. Like, if you sit there worrying about the mistakes all day, guess what? You take away time. You take away energy from doing what you're going to do. If you listen to your haters, right, you pay attention to your haters. Like, while you're giving them energy, you, you're not going where you're supposed to be going. So while the crowd, all is making all kind of noise, Cam, 21 nut, 24-7, Cam playing through it as if it doesn't exist. As if Auburn is the only one in the stadium. As if uh, the, the, uh, the Alabama fans aren't there. As if the defense isn't there. As if nobody's there. They're just playing through it. So guess what, man? My man 12 and 0. Looking at a possibility of winning the Heisman Trophy. Looking at the possibility of winning the national championship. Why? Simple. Because he showed up. And when things look bleak, when things look dark, he believed. He believed in the dark. He believed in the dark with the creator. So even though it looked dark, he still played one final one. He played through it. He got to learn it. <clears throat> yep, you're going to have to stay up late. You, be, you heard me say it before. You're going to have to one of the bags. You're going to be. You're going to have to give up some stuff. Yep, you might only get three more hours. It's finals time. We're getting ready for final exam. Yep, you might have to give up some TV. Yep, you might have to give up some of the luxuries. Yep, the movies. Yep, you might have to give up some stuff because we're at the end of the year and you're going to have a lot of time left. But, man, whatever you do, man, keep believing. For real. It should be way easy, man. Keep believing. Play through it. Because you'll never get to the, you'll never get to success without going through that stuff. All right? Listen to me. I'm challenging you. I'm challenging you. New, next year is going to be a whole new ET, but I'm challenging you right now. I'm challenging you. Don't give up. Don't give in. All right? Whatever you do, if there's some stuff you want to quit, can you do me a favor? Don't quit until January 1st. Can you do that for me? Can you just hang in there until January 1st? Can, can you just run through the river for me these last couple of weeks? Can you just run through the river for me? School, don't give up yet. Don't go home yet. That job, don't quit that job just yet. Don't just, you, you only got a couple more weeks. Can, can you just run through it for me? Can you just run through the river? And once you get to the river and we start a brand new year, we can start all over from scratch. We can start all over from scratch. But whatever you do for me as we end this, in this year, man, I need to believe it was faith. Faith is something things hope and evidence of things not seen. Impossible is nothing. Matter of fact, I'm gonna leave with that quote. One of my favorite quotes, right? I, I, I'm gonna leave that. I'm gonna leave that for you. All right. I'm gonna 
I'll leave that for you because I want you to read this thing. We're going to put a little music behind it for you, but I want you to read this thing. All right, remember, man, remember, man, you're not a victim. So stop talking like one, stop thinking like one, and stop acting like one. You're not a victim. You're a victim. And the only thing stands between your success, the only thing stands from you doing what, what, what you know you've been called to do. The only thing is you. Nobody can mm -hmm. stop you. Listen to me. If God is for you, who can be against you? Can't nobody stop you. You're the only person that can stop you. So stop talking like a victim. Stop thinking like a victim. Stop acting like a victim. And walk into your destiny. Walk into your destiny, bro. Listen to me, sis. Walk into it. Remember, bro, for real progress. There is no success, bro. There is no progress, son. None whatsoever without going through a little struggle. You gotta go through the struggle, but after the struggle is the reward. After the struggle is the victory. What's the name? It's a special edition. That's right. It's a special edition of Thank God is Monday. Thank God is Monday. I'll see you next Monday, man. Remember, man. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Okay. If you're interested in hearing more about what Eric Thomas has to say, he does. He has hundreds of lectures posted on YouTube for students just like yourselves mm -hmm. who are really kind of, you know, college students going through it and he knows exactly what you're experiencing, I guarantee you. So if you're really interested in knowing more about him, get his app on YouTube, uh, excuse me, download his videos on YouTube or you can download his app right to your cell phones and just kind of get that, you know, kind of inspiration back into your lives. Now we'd like to call up uh, Julius Ware to the stage, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thought I was set. Um, I'd like to read a short story by Langston Hughes, entitled, For President. What is this the big shots are saying about us Negroes being cool because there might be a Negro president in the year 2011 in the USA? Huh? If I'm going to run for president, I want to run now because by 2011, I will be too cool. One time at the Apollo Theater, I heard Jackie Moms Mabley talking about the good old days. She said, what good old days? I was there. There wasn't no good old days. I agreed with her. First thing I remember in my youthhood was depression. Everybody was on relief that could get on relief. But if you, were, but if you was colored down south, you had a hard time getting on relief. Even getting in a CCC camp where you were a teenage boy. Them things was for white. If you be black, be hungry. Be black, don't look for help from the government. Be black, just stay black and die. What good old days? When? Then came the war. Suppose you wanted to wear one of them pretty navy uniforms or fly in the sky. You better be white. Else cook or scrub in the navy and not fly in no sky. No Negroes in the Air Force, not then. Suppose you want to give your blood to the Red Cross. Uh-uh. No black blood accepted. When they finally did, they put it in black cans. And just to try to work in a war plant down south, what good old days. Also, in the war days, try to get on a train down south to go somewhere else. The one color coach was always crowded when it came to your town. No more room for Negro, no more room for Negroes, the conductor would cry. The good old days, when? They didn't want you in the south, and they didn't want to let you out. You finally get up north, you sleep six in a room, work on the docks, loading ammunition, with the union not sure it wants you or don't. Ride that long subway to Harlem. Everything's so high uptown, it uses up all your money in no time. What good old days. Can't even be a clerk in your own butcher shop where you trade in Harlem or a, or a bartender in the bar where you spend your money. Good old days, when, where? Now they come talking about cooling off period. Were I any cooler, I would be dead. How long must I wait? Like the blues say, can I get it now or must I hesitate? I'm still looking for the good old days and they don't come yet. 
Now they tell me I got to wait 40 or 50 years to be president. I do not want to wait that long. I want to be president now because I wish to decree Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, and Louisiana out of the union. I wish to give them states to the devil because it would take fire and brimstone to straighten them out. I would save only the dogs down there because dogs is nothing but dumb animals. And I don't, and I do not believe in sending dogs to hell. The Negroes in them states ought to know Judgment Day is coming. The Negroes in them states ought to know Judgment Day is coming, so let them make their peace. Get away or else. If they if they else, let be like them freedom riders else in a big way. As to cool it off, me, cool off from what? I never held nothing hot. Who has got the guns and dogs and billy clubs and ballots in the South? <clears throat> Who does the lynchings and beatings and mobbings and name callings? Whose blood rushes to their heads when they see a black face? Who gets hot under the collar when the, when the Supreme Court edicts an edict that don't stick? Who calls every black man red that wants a piece of white bread? Suppose I was to run for president. Who would need to cool off most? Not me. Not mine. Not Mose. Not Karina. Not Reverend Martin Luther King. Either Reverend Shuttleworth. Them black men is cool already. Cool. Cool. Jack. Cool. You be cool too, Mr. President. Don't go put no ideas in my head about running for president. I just might do it now. I am simple. Does anybody know who Simple? The character Simple? Has anybody ever heard of the character Simple? He was a character um, created by Langston Hughes, who was a um, black Renaissance poet. Let me just read, read a little bit to you about who Simple was. This is from the Simple Omnibus. Forward, who is Simple? I cannot truthfully state, as some novelists do at the, beginning, at the beginnings of their books, that, there's, that these stories are about nobody living or dead. The facts are, these tales are about a great many people, although they are stories about no specific persons as such. But it is impossible to live in Harlem and, know, and not know at least 100 Simples, 50 Joyces, 25 Zaritas, a number of Boyds, and several Cousin Minis, or reasonable facsimiles thereof. Simple Speaks His Mind. Simple Speaks His Mind had hardly been published when I walked into a Harlem cafe one night and the proprietor said, listen, I don't know where you got that character Just Be Simple, but I want you to meet one of my customers who is just like him. He called to a fellow at the end of the bar. Watch how he walks, he said, exactly like Simple. And I'll bet he won't be talking to you two minutes before he'll tell you how long he's been standing on his feet and how much his bunions hurt. Just like your book begins. The barman was right. Even as the customer approached, he cried, man, my feet hurt. If you want to see me, why don't you come over here where I am? I stands on my feet all day. And I stand on mine all night, said the bartender. Without me saying a word, the conversation began. The conversation began so much like the opening chapter in my book that even I was a bit amazed to see how nearly life can be like fiction or vice versa. Simple as a character originated during the war. His first words came directly out of the mouth of a young man who lived just down the block from me. One night, I ran into him in a neighborhood bar and said, and he said, come on back to the booth and meet my girlfriend. I did, and he treated me to a beer. Not knowing much about the young man, I asked him where he worked. He said, in the war plane. I said, what do you do? He said, cranks. I said, what kind of cranks? He said, oh man, I don't know what kind of cranks. I said, well, I said, well do they crank cars, tanks, buses, planes, or what? He said, I don't know what them cranks crank. 
Whereupon his girlfriend, a little put out at this ignorance of his job, said, You've been working there long enough. Looks like by now you ought to know what them cranks crank. Oh, woman, he said, you know white folks don't tell colored folks what cranks crank. That was the beginning of simple. I have long since lost track of a fellow who uttered those words. But out of that mystery as, it, as to what the cranks of this world crank, to whom they belong, and why there evolved the character in this book. I'm sure everybody knows somebody like Simple. And so that's why I chose to read that. Thank you. Thank you Elise. I'd like to invite Lauren Schmidt to the podium, please. Um, first, I just want to say thank you to everyone for being here and taking part in this celebration. And thank you especially to the organizers. Can we have a round of applause for them? <laughs> I'm just going to read one poem by Robert Hayden. And it's about another African American, um, perhaps the best American that we have. And this poem is called Frederick Douglass. When it is finally ours, this freedom, this liberty, this beautiful and terrible thing, needful to man as air, usable as earth. When it belongs at last to all, when it is truly instinct, brain matter, diastole, systole, reflex action, when it is finally won, when it is more than the gaudy mumbo jumbo of politicians, this man, this Douglas, this former slave, this Negro beaten to his knees, exiled, visioning a world where none is lonely, none hunted, alien, this man, superb in love and logic, this shall be remembered. Oh, not with statues, rhetoric, not with legends and poems and wreaths of bronze alone, but with the lives grown out of his life, the lives fleshing his dream of the beautiful, needful thing. Thank you. I'd like to invite... Just a comment. I sure. I believe it's Frederick Douglass's birthday today. Is it? Well, thank you very much. Thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> I'd like to invite Professor Nina Allsbrook Jackson to the podium. Thank you. So when I heard that we were going to be doing the reading, I wanted to make sure that I brought you a poet who was engaging because oftentimes people get the misconception that poetry is boring. It doesn't have to be. Um, and so we're going to be reading a couple of works by Nikki Giovanni. I picked Nikki Giovanni because Nikki Giovanni has lived since 1943 and is currently still alive. So if you think about the span of things she's seen as a woman, as a poet, as a person of color, as a human being, She's seen a lot, and she continues to see a lot. And so I tried to pick works that show different aspects of the things that she's seen, all right? We're gonna start off on Nikki kind of reflecting on humanity. Sometimes as a human being, you don't get to do the stuff that you want. You get stuck with the things that you have to do. Um, and so she just writes in plain English, what do you do with the life that you have to live as opposed to the life that you want to live? The name of this poem is Choices. If I can't do what I want to do, then my job is to not do what I don't want to do. And it's not the same thing, but it's the best that I can do. If I can't have what I want, then my job is to want what I've got and be satisfied that there is at least something more to want. Since I can't go where I need to go, then I must go where the sign points me. Though always understanding parallel movement isn't lateral. When I can't express what I really feel, I practice feeling what I can express, and none of it is equal, I know. But that's why mankind alone among the animals learns to cry. <laughs> Nikki Giovanni, coming up in the, in the 50s and the 60s, her concept of womanhood is very different than the independence and the liberties that you enjoy today. So she remembers a time where to be a woman is to kind of be quiet and to be told to be still and to be told to wait. And if that's not in your nature, 
that doesn't necessarily work well for you. And so she explores the concept of womanhood as well. It's called All I Gotta Do. All I gotta do is sit and wait, sit and wait, and it's gonna find me. All I gotta do is sit and wait if I can learn how. What I need to do is sit and wait, cause I'm a woman. Sit and wait. What I gotta do is sit and wait, cause I'm a woman, and it'll find me. They say you get yours and I'll get mine if I learn to sit and wait. But you got yours, and I want mine, and I'm gonna get it, cause I gotta get it, cause I need to get it, if I learn how. Thought about calling for it on the phone, asked for a delivery, but they didn't have it. Thought about going to the store to get it, walked to the corner, but they didn't have it. Called your name in my sleep, sitting and waiting, thought you would awake me, called you, but you didn't have it, offered to go get it, but you didn't have it, so I'm sitting. All I know is sitting and waiting, waiting and sitting, cause I'm a woman. All I know is sitting and waiting, cause I gotta wait, wait for it to find me. Giovanni had a couple of poems on race and she's viewed it through a couple of lenses. She's viewed it through anger, she's viewed it through protest. Um, and so I took the one that mirrored um, Langston Hughes's I Too. She did a poem called We Too. I was home in Lincoln Heights named for Abraham as many other small black communities are. Only 20 years old, not cowardly. I had picketed Rich's department store in Knoxville. I sat in with Fisk University in Nashville but not all that brave either. Mommy didn't want me to go, neither did my father, and I wondered, would it matter? 50 years later, I know it did. We watched, we prayed, we too were inspired. I didn't go. I stayed home and reminded myself, we also served, who sit and wait. The last thing that I'm going to read is Nikki Giovanni's reflection to being a poet. Anybody that is a writer, regardless to what you write, you understand that words are powerful. They can paint a picture for people who aren't there to see what you see or who aren't in a place to feel what you feel. And so she reflects on this in poetry. Poetry is motion graceful as a fawn, gentle as a teardrop. Strong like the eye finding peace in a crowded room. We poets tend to think our words are golden. Though emotion speaks too loudly to be defined by silence. Sometimes after midnight or just before the dawn, we sit, typewriters in hand, pulling loneliness around us. Forgetting our lovers or children who are sleeping. Ignoring the weary wariness of our own logic to compose a poem. No one understands it. It never says, love me, for poets are beyond love. It never says, accept me, for poems seek not acceptance, but controversy. It never says, I am, and therefore, I concede that you are too. A poem is pure energy, horizontally contained between the mind of the poet and the ear of the reader. It does not sing, discard the ear, for poetry is song. If it does not delight, discard the heart, for poetry is joy. If it does not inform, then close off the brain, for it is dead. If it cannot heed the insistent message that life is precious, which is all we poets wrapped in our loneliness are trying to say. Thank you very much, Professor Osbrook. I'd like to invite Andre Brown to the stage, please. Hello everyone. So I'm gonna I'm a poet. I'm a student here at PCC. I'm graduating this May with a degree in theater, and I'm gonna share some of my own original work. This first one is a dedication to the one and only Dr. King. I call it One for the King. He is the martyr of the martyrs. His name makes my heart sing. Brothers, sisters, sons, daughters. All hail Dr. King, the standard of peace with the destiny unique. Shown equality the least, 
but always turn the other cheek. They took our money, making us spend more than less. Instead of the back of the seat, Dr. King said, Dr. King said protest. Sit-ins and beatdowns are a few of what he went through. So when faced with adversity, I think, what would Dr. King do? He paved the way for a generation in a country doing wrong. Instead of one day, let's honor him all year long. Words can't express his impact on relationships and race. So I think I speak for all of us when I say, thank you, Dr. King, for making this world a better place. So, there's something new I just wrote. It's called, uh, The Time Is Now. And I was, uh, I was inspired. Oh yeah, I represent the Rare Artistic Writers. We're a poetry club here at PCC. Anybody who's interested in, you know, sharing their poetry or just coming through and hearing some poetry, our meetings are always this time every week, 8 to 11. So, this is called The Time Is Now. It's inspired by um, a prompt that my club was, uh, everybody in the club was given to do, and I was also inspired by the New Year. You know, everybody makes those New Year's resolutions, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. So, I call this one The Time Is Now. The time is now to attack your goals head on and stick with it. The time is now to heal. Take every negative emotion you feel and flip it. The time is now to recognize frowns keep you down. Embrace the power of love in every hug. Clear the conscience and repent. The time is now for the 99 to stand together and rise up over the 1%. The, there's power and prestige, position, currency, and affirmations of the new. Despite all the power there is externally, the time is now to realize there's no greater power than the power within you. Forget about, forget about opportunities missed. No matter how much you wish, you can't go back to the start. You can choose to move on, right your wrongs, and never break. The time is now to take your choice and choose to forget about poverty and heartbreak. Forgot, forget about Darren Wilson, George Zimmerman, the fact justice wasn't served at all. Let's see what karma brings. The time is now to realize God sees all and the riots in Ferguson didn't solve a thing. Dr. King taught us the power of peaceful protest. Turn the other cheek and fight on. The only way to cast out darkness is to cut the lights on. This is the time to shine like the star you are. Give everything your best. The time is now to occupy abandoned buildings, fix them up, give the hungry and homeless a place to rest. The time is now to keep your hopes and dreams wrapped tight like glad. Nurture the youth. Be better than the parents you had. Break the cycles. Cut the ties. Uncover the truth. Bury the lies. Take off the mask. Burn the disguise. Overcome addiction. Remove the veil from your eyes. Break out of the storm. Transform. And give the world a reason to say, wow. Forget about yesterday. Pave the way for tomorrow today. Instead of waiting 10 years or 2 hours, do it now. Latoya Reed. Well, um, that was a really tough act to follow, follow so I'll do my best. Um, I'm actually going to read an excerpt from The Color of Water, which some of you may be familiar with. It's um, a, a book, a memoir, that is covered in a lot of the English classes here at PCCC. It was written by James McBride, and in it, James McBride writes about his, his mother. James McBride is a, um, a biracial man whose mother was born as a Jew, and she later converted to Christianity, and uh, went on to raise 12 children, children in, uh, in uh, New York. So she had a very interesting life. And the chapter that I'm going to read focuses it's called the New Testament, and it focuses on um, the black church experience. And when I first read this, this chapter, um, it really resonated with me because so much of what he talks about in this chapter um, were things that I could identify from my, from my childhood. So the New Testament from the color of water. <clears throat> Mommy loved God. She went to church each and every Sunday, the only white person in sight, butchering the lovely hymns with a singing voice that sounded like a cross between a cold engine trying to crank on an October morning and a whining Maytag washer. My siblings and I would muffle our laughter as mommy dug into hymns with verve and gusto. Lady, 
Oh, lean in, safe and secure. Up, up, and away she went, her shrill voice climbing higher and higher, reminding us of Curly from the Three Stooges. It sounded so horrible that I often thought Reverend Owens, our minister, would get up from his seat and stop the song. He'd sit at his pulpit in a spiritual trance, his eyes closed, clad in a long blue robe with a white scarf and billowed sleeves, as if he were preparing to float away to the hev float away to heaven himself, until one of mommy's clunker notes roused him. One eye would pop open with a jolt, as if someone had just poured cold water down his back. He'd coolly run the eye in a circle, gazing around at the congregation of 40-odd parishioners to see where the whirring noise had come from. When his eye landed on Mommy, he would nod as if to say, oh yes, it's just this to joy. Then he'd slip back into his spiritual trance. In the real world, Mommy was Mrs. McBride or Mrs. Jordan, depending on, who, on whether she used my father's or stepfather's name. But in Reverend Owens's church, she was Sister Jordan. Sister Jordan brought a quite few of her children today, Reverend Owens would marvel as Mommy stumbled in with six of us trailing her. Quite a few. We thought he was hilarious. He was our Sunday school teacher and also the local barber who cut our hair once a month when we grew big enough to refuse Mommy's own efforts in that direction. She literally put a bowl on your head and cut around it. He was a thin man who wore polyester suits and styled his hair in the old slick back conk. Back combed to the back in rippling waves. He could not read very well. I could read better than he could when I was only 12. He'd stand on the pulpit, handkerchief in hand, wrestling with the Bible verses like a man possessed. He'd begin with, our verse for today is, uh, um, flipping through the pages of his Bible, finally finding the verse, putting his finger on it, and you could hear the clock going, tick, tock, tick, tock, as he struggled with the words, moving his lips silently while the church waited on edge, and my sister Helen, the church pianist, stifled her giggles and mommy glared at her, shaking her fist and silently promising vengeance once church was over. <laughs> Reverend Owens' sermon started like a tiny choo-choo train and ended up like a roaring locomotive. He'd begin in a slow drawl, then get warmed up and jerked back and forth over the subject matter like a stutterer gone wild. We know today, I said, um, we know that ah, Jesus the church goes, amen. Came down. Yes, amen. I said, came down. Go on. He came on down and led people of Jerusalem. Amen. <laughs> then he'd shift to a babbling amen mode where he spoke in a fast motion and the words popped out of his mouth like artillery rounds. Amen fired across the room like bullets. It's so good, amen, to know God, amen. I tell you, amen, that if you, amen, only come, amen, to God yourself, amen, then there will be, amen, no turning back, amen, amen, amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> and there we were in aisle five, Sister Jordan in her church hat and blue dress, chuckling and smiling and occasionally waving her hands in the air like everyone else. Mommy loved church any church, even Reverend Owens's whosoever Baptist church, even though he wasn't her favorite minister because he left his wife, or vice versa, we never knew. Mommy was a connoisseur of ministers. She knew them the way a French wine connoisseur sort of knows Boujolet red or Vouvray white. Reverend Owens, despite his t preaching talents, wasn't even in the top five. That elite list included my late father, the late Reverend W. Abner Brown of Metropolitan Baptist in Harlem, our friendly friend, Reverend Edward Belton, and a few others, all of whom were black. And with that exception, Reverend Belton quite did. She considered them old timers, men of dignity and dedication who grew up in the South and remembered what life was like in the old days. They knew how to fire up a church the old fashioned way without talk of politics or bad mouthing or negativity, but of real talk of God and genuine concern for his parishioners. Your father, she often used, he'd give anybody his last dime. 
She did not like large churches with political preachers, nor Pentecostal churches that were too wild. And despite her slight dislike of Reverend Owens and his odd style, he once preached a sermon on the word the, T-H-E. She had respect for him because his church and preachings were close in a style to that of her home church, New Brown Memorial. Unlike New Brown, however, whosoever wasn't a storefront church, it was a tiny brick building that stood alone about 15 feet back from the sidewalk with a sign above the door that read that was done by a painter who began his lettering without taking into account how little space he had. It read, whosoever Baptist church. I never saw mommy get happy at whosoever Baptist, meaning get the spirit and lose control, thank God. When people got happy, it was too much for me. They were mostly women, big mamas whom I knew and loved. But when the good Lord climbed into their bones and lifted them up towards sweet liberty, kind, gentle women who mussed my hair and kissed my cheek and gave me dimes, would burst out of their seats like Pittsburgh Steeler linebacks. Oh, yes! They'd cry, arms out, outstretched, dancing in the aisles, slithering around with the agility of the Pink Panther, shuddering violently, purse flying one way, hat going another, while some poor old sober looking deacon tried grimly to hang on to them to keep them from hurting themselves, only to be shaken off like a fly. Sometimes two or three people would physically hold the spirited person to keep her from hurting herself while we looked on in awe. But the person convulsing, conversing, mm, convulsing and hollering, Jesus, Jesus, yes, with Reverend Owens winging along with his spirited amens and ah yeses. I never understood why God would climb into these people with such fervor until I became a grown man myself and came to understand the nature and power of God's many blessings. But even as a boy, I knew God was all powerful because, mommy's utter, because of mommy's utter deference to him. And also because she would occasionally do something in church, I never saw her do it home or anywhere else. At some point in the service, usually when the congregation was singing one of her favorite songs, like, We've Come This Far By Faith, or What a Friend We Have in Jesus, she would bow her head and weep. It was the only time I ever saw her cry. Why do you cry in church? I asked her one afternoon after service. Because God makes me happy. Then why cry? I'm crying because I'm happy. Anything wrong with that? No. But there was, because happy people did not seem to cry like she did. Mommy's tears seemed to come from somewhere else, a place far away, a place inside her that she never let any, children, any of us children visit. And even as a boy, I felt there was pain behind that. I thought it was because she wanted to be black like everyone else in the church, because maybe God liked black people better. And one afternoon, on the way home from church, I asked her whether God was black or white. Oh boy, God's not black. He's not white, he's the spirit. Does he, li does he like black people or white people better? He loves all people, he's a spirit. What's the spirit? A spirit's a spirit. <laughs> what color is God's spirit? It doesn't have a color. God is the color of water. Yes. Water doesn't have a color. One Sunday morning in Sunday school, my brother Richie raised his hand and asked Reverend Owens, is Jesus white? Reverend Owens said no. Then how come they make him white here in this picture? Richie said and held up his Sunday school Bible. Reverend Owens said, Jesus is all colors. Then why is he white? This here looked like a white man to me. <laughs> Richie held the picture high so everyone in class could see it. Don't he look white to you? Nobody said anything. <laughs> Reverend Owens was stuck. He stood there wiping his face with his handkerchief and making the same noise while he preached. Well, uh, uh, well, uh. I was embarrassed. The rest of the kids stared at Richie like he was crazy. Richie, forget it, man. No, if they put Jesus in this picture here and he ain't white and he ain't black, they should make him gray. Jesus should be gray. <laughs> Richie stopped going to Sunday school after that, though he never stopped believing in God. Mommy tried and tried to make him go back, but he wouldn't. Mommy took great pride in our relationship to God. Every Easter, we had to perform at the New Brown, New Brown Church, playing our instruments and reciting a story from the Bible for the entire church congregation. Mommy looked forward to this day with anticipation, while my siblings and I dreaded it like the plague. 
always waiting till the morning of the event before memorizing the Bible story we would recite. I never had problems with these memory crunching sessions, but one year my older brother Billy, whose memory would later serve him well enough to take him through Yale University Medical School, marched to the front of the church wearing suit and tie, faced the congregation, started out, when Jesus first came to, then blanked out completely. He stood there twitching nervously, dead in the water, while my siblings and I winced and held our breath to keep from laughing. Oh, that's all right now, my godfather murmured, Deacon McNair from his seat on the dais next to the minister, while mommy twitched in her seat watching Billy, her face reddening. Try again. Okay. When Jesus first came to, no wait, uh, Jerusalem was, wait a minute, mm -mm. He stood there, stalled, gazing at the ceiling, biting his lip, desperately trying to remember the Bible story he had memorized just a half hour before, while the church murmured, oh, that's all right now, just keep trying. And Mommy glared at him, furious. A few more embarrassing seconds passed. Finally, Deacon McNair said, well, you don't have to tell us the Bible story, Billy. Just recite a verse from the Bible. Any verse? Any verse you want. Okay. Billy faced the church again. Every face was silent watching him. Jesus wept, and then he took a seat. <laughs> Dead silence. Amen, said Deacon McNair. And after church, we followed Mommy as she stalked out, and my godfather met her at the door. It's all right, Ruth, he said, chuckling. No, it's not, Ma said. And when we got home, Mommy beat Billy's butt. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Reed. We have a book club happening as well on campus. We just happen to be reading The Color of Water. So if you'd like to participate in that book club and that reading event, uh, please stop by at the desk here. I'll have your name and I can get you a copy of the book and you can join us in that event as well. Now I'd like to call up Amanda Kibler. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to read a poem by Tara Betts called What It's Like to Be a Mixed Girl for, for Those Who Aren't. Well, I've got to say, it's people claiming you're torn between tragic paths when you know exactly where you walk. It's hair being pulled out by girls who see stuck up high yellow chick stamped on your breath. It's brothers blurting, damn, I thought you was white, then asking for your phone number. It's being painted with zebra stripes, with brushes that assume you're confused. It's classical and hip hop symbols clashing. It's comparing yourself to chocolate, vanilla, swirl, pudding pops, so you don't carry the weight of in between and enslaved fractions for names. It's your coworker's bottom lip dropping low when you hang Audre Lorde's picture above your desk. It's recognizing a bass-filled moan rolling into a phone receiver from your mouth. It's questions, transitions, connections. It's tackling which hair moisturizer you won't. Won't make greasy clumps or itchy scalp with no help from mama. It's dreaming your hair curls in proportion to your miraculously dark skin, then waking up when your voice reminds you you're black. Good afternoon. I'm going to first start out by reading a poem by Langston Hughes, one of my favorite poems of any poet that I've ever read. Then I'm going to read one of my own pieces. This poem here is one of my personal favorites because of the depths of Langston's ideas, which made him a, one of the greatest poets that I've known. He had a way of painting pictures with his words. He could take the most complex situations and just fill them with, like, put them in simple garbs, so to say. The name of this poem was The Negro Mother, which was a poem he wrote to his mother, for his mother. Children, I come back today to tell you a story of the long, dark way that I had to climb, that I had to know, in order that the race might live and grow. Look at my face, dark as the night yet shining like the sun with love's true light. I am the dark girl who crossed the Red Sea, carrying in my body the seed of the free. I am the woman who worked in the field, bringing the cotton and the corn to yield. 
I am the woman who labored as a slave, beaten and mistreated for the work that I gave. Children sold away from me, my husband sold too. No safety, no love, no respect was I due. 300 years in the deepest south, but God put a song and a prayer in my mouth. God put a dream like the steel in my soul. Now through my children, I'm reaching the goal. Now through my children, young and free, I realized the blessing given to me. I couldn't read then, I couldn't write. I had nothing back there in that night. Sometimes the valley was filled with tears, but I kept trudging on through those lonely years. Sometimes the road was hot with the sun, but I had to keep on till my work was done. I had to keep on, no stopping for me. I was the seed of the coming free. I nourished the dream that nothing could smother deep in my breast, the Negro mother. I had only opened then and hope, but now through you, dark ones of today, my dreams must come true. All you dark children in the world out there, remember my sweat, my pain, my despair. Remember my years, heavy with sorrow, and make those years a torch for tomorrow. Make of my past a road to the light, out of the darkness, the ignorance, the night. Lift high my banner out of the dust, stand like free men supporting my trust. Believe in the right, let none push you back. Remember the whip and the slaver's track. Remember how the strong in struggle and strife still bar you the way and deny you life. But march ever forward, breaking down bars. Look ever upward at the sun and the stars. Oh, my dark children, may my dreams and my prayers impel you forever up those great stairs. For I will be with you till no brother dares to keep you down, children of the Negro mother. This poem I'm about to read is a poem that I wrote regarding all the incidents happening of late of uh, the issue in New York with Eric Gardner and those of in Ferguson. It's called The Injustice of Their Justice. Today, there should be no second guessing the lesson I'm professing. I'm shining, on, I'm shining a light on who the government's been oppressing and the job being done by the Human Rights Committee for a lack of better words has really been shitty. The government's war on terror created a generalized climate for the impunity of law enforcement officers and didn't hide it. This has contributed to the erosion and accountability mechanisms we had for these agencies. Our oppressors have always been foul, but now they're allowed to do it more flagrantly, which has created a rise in government abuse and police brutality, and now they persist unabated, undeterred, and unpunished nationally. It's opened my eyes, and this has become a disaster to me. One nation under God, that's blasphemy. This government is the biggest gang in our nation, and the police are the henchmen that are the ones defacing their constitution. And without retribution, if you think about it, the whole thing is confusing. If you give a racist or a bigot that much power, sooner or later they'll abuse it. And having politicians of color hasn't made a difference. The system's useless. Regarding the case of Eric Gardner, we all know what the truth is. Who thinks this man should have died for selling to Lucy? I hope no one, because it's clear-cut abuse to me. The government has made it one of their top priorities, whether right or wrong, to profile the young, the poor, and minorities. But if we sit by idle and allow this kind of injustice to continue, not long from now, I could have been Mike Brown, and Eric Gardner could have been you. Welcome Sadia Phillips from the Alumni Association. Hello everyone. This poem is by Maya Angelou, entitled Equality. You declare you see me dimly through a glass which will not shine. Though I stand before you boldly, trim in rank and mark in time, you do own to hear me faintly as a whisper out of rage while my drums beat out the message and the rhythms never change. Equality and I will be free. You announce my ways are wanton, that I fly from man to man. But if I'm just a shadow to you, could you ever understand? We have lived in a painful history. We know the shameful past. But I keep on marching forward. 
and you just keep on coming last. Equality, and I will be free. Take the blinders from your vision. Take the padding from your ears. And confess you've heard me crying, and admit you've seen my tears. Hear the tempo so compelling. Hear the blood throb in my veins. Yes, my drums are beating nightly, and the rhythms never change. Equality, and I will be free. I would like to thank, actually all of you, stand up, clap for yourselves, really for coming and participating in this event. I'd like to thank the representatives from Raw, Andre Brown, Amanda Kibler, Miguel de Jesus, thank you for coming and joining us, Julia Square, Sadia Phillips, and um, I just want to let you know, today you join hundreds of other college students and organizations in celebrating African American history Month through an African American reading. Um, I just kind of want to leave, leave you with a few words. Uh, I hope today was inspiring and that these words continue to inspire your lives. Thank you all for joining us. God be with you. And remember to show up, right? Be present and always follow your dreams. Thank you, guys. There's Every day that goes by, every moment you will find, there's a broken heart, a tear is cried, a wish is made that never comes true. And somewhere, someone needs to be found. All the things we do.
take them by the hand and help them find their way. When you're walking down the street and you see a man who has no food to eat, just reach into your pocket and help make it stay. Now I'm 